the Ardent Sensor Meta. Just the name will infuriate some League of Legends players. But for all the heat that that version of the item and the meta it helped define got, without it we wouldn't have had one of the greatest series in League of Legends history, when Misfits Gaming almost took down reigning back-to-back -back world champions SK Telecom T1, not by figuring out the meta, but by disregarding it entirely and forcing the other teams at the tournament to do the same. The frustration came from the fact that the meta was pretty well defined, which, depending on who you ask, is just another word for boring. Put an easy to execute tank in the top lane, have strong engage in either the jungle or support role, control mages in the mid lane, make sure your ADC scales well into the late game, and for the love of all that is good, make sure someone can build an ardent sensor. The meta is always skewed to a degree to champions and items that are strong, but the power of the ardent sensor at the time had a disproportionate effect on not just the bottom lane where it usually found its home, but how the game ought to have been most efficiently played as a whole. The version of the Ardent Sensor in Patch 718, which Worlds 2017 was played on, was actually a slightly nerfed version of the item from just two patches prior, but still extremely potent and meta-defining. The item's wielder could shield or heal a teammate and give them a 20% buff to their attack speed and increase damage and healing on each auto attack. The end result was supports becoming batteries to power up their AD carries, a role that already by its nature builds items that scale multiplicatively into the late game, and now even more so with the power of the item. Not including a champion that could be that battery for your ADC in your team's composition was tantamount to throwing away an advantage that the game dropped into your lap. Enchanter supports like Janna, Rakan, and Lulu ruled the bottom lane with a near guaranteed build path that allowed teams to win entire games on the back of a hyperscaling bot lane duo. As the meta solidified, the better bottom lane won more often than not, setting the stage for teams like the reigning world champions SK Telecom T1 to take full advantage given their already developed playstyle. Combine this with a meta that focused on getting your support, their ardent sensor, as fast as possible to start playing for the late game, and the team became almost unbeatable. As is often said, in the game's first few years, the book on how to play League of Legends was written by Korea. To argue whether the item made the meta or the meta made the item is a broader philosophical discussion for any such esport, but the fact of the matter was that given their style and the talent of Korean teams, this was a dream come true. Their playstyle and the game itself were in perfect harmony for this late game objective and team fight focused meta. To say the meta didn't have counterplay wouldn't be accurate, but it was simply too risky given that it so heavily favored the teams with the most talent. But at Worlds 2017, this meta and its synergistic effect with the top Korean teams in the world went from unquestioned to fallible in the span of just one quarter final between Misfits and SKT, the biggest upset that almost happened in world's history. 2017 was the last year that the LCK dominated internationally to the degree that they did. They executed their fundamentals, played the map extremely well, fought very methodically and intentionally around specific objectives and item power spikes, didn't make mistakes, and always punished those of their opponents. By the time the game got to the later stages and the late scaling team compositions that they drafted started to peak, they were rewarded for taking care of their fundamentals over the course of the game via a final knockout punch to win the game. While a bit of an overgeneralization, this slow, handshaky, scaling and objective-focused style of play more often than not got the job done for LCK teams, despite being sometimes unbelievably boring to watch. The Ardent Sensor chapter was the latest in the LCK authored tome on how to most effectively play League of Legends. By 2018, China and other regions had read the book multiple times over and started to add their own more aggressive high-pressure appendices to the end of it. But in 2017, that book was still gospel. And if you could design an item that encapsulated the scaling style that the best LCK teams championed, it was that year's iteration of the Ardent Sensor. Misfits were not only up against the odds, but they were battling a meta that was stacked heavily in favor of SKT. Misfits Gaming, on the other hand, came into the quarterfinal matchup as huge underdogs. Every analyst predicted a 3-0 for SKT before the series, and you'd have been hard-pressed to find anyone that disagreed. Hailing from the LEC as its second seed, Misfits Gaming were led by Ignar, a shot-calling support who was the center of the team's playstyle. This playstyle favored Ignar being on champions with a lot of agency and ability to start fights or pick off valuable targets. Champions like Leona, Blitzcrank, and Nautilus fit that bill, but they didn't fit the meta, at least not as much as Janna, Lulu, Karma, Rakan, and other shield-heavy enchanters that would benefit from the most broken item in the game. Up against the objectively superior SKT, if Misfits tried to beat them at their own scaling meta-focused game, they would get run over. That's exactly what happened in Game 1. SKT did what they do best, 
read the meta, executed on it perfectly, and stomped Misfits in just 25 minutes. Let this one end until they get to the fountain. The rest of SKT's inside the base, and Ignar's the next in their eyes right after Power of Evil. The five minutes for the first match of Hero Far, he's doing what he can, going for broke. But SKT's already got that for themselves. 16 to 1, 25 minutes in. Game one to SKT over Misfits. They say the definition of insanity is trying the same thing over and over again, expecting different results, and Misfits saw the writing on the wall. Ignar and company threw caution and the meta to the wind and decided in game two to put their playmaking support on, well, a playmaker. Because as effective as SKT's strategy was of playing safe, low-risk League of Legends until the game scaled your champions enough to be able to run over any teamfight with the lead you had slowly accrued, it only worked if you had, in fact, built up that lead in the first place. And with the meta the way it was at the time, it was considered, to put it kindly, a high-risk, high-reward strategy to try and deny enemy scaling as opposed to safely building your own on the back of your hyperscaling bot lane. If Ignar was to choose supports with agency that could force fights and disrupt SKT's game plan, then Misfits could gain the upper hand during the early and mid-game instead, and take those late-game teamfights on far more even footing. So, that's exactly what they did. Meta be damned. In Game 2, Ignar swapped over to Blitzcrank in order to stifle SKT's mid-game by literally taking Faker's Corky out of the picture with pinpoint hook after pinpoint hook. Misfits used those man advantages to create windows of controlled aggression that put the Korean Goliaths on their heels over and over again. 26 minutes later, the series was all tied up. And Ignar didn't stop there. After yanking key opponents into certain death on Blitzcrank in Game 2's mid-game, he locked in Leona in Game 3 to bring the pain right to SKT ADC Bang's doorstep in the laning phase in the form of the crippling crowd control that her abilities provide. If Misfits' early gamble were to fail, there was no doubt that SKT's proven ardent sensor-centric bot lane pair of Vayne and Lulu would take that small early game advantage and use it to take over the rest of the game. But what if the risk paid off. Jump started by a stadium rattling highlight 2-0 double kill in the early game, Misfits bottom lane denied the safety and scaling of SKT's picks and carried them to a second straight victory. The reigning back-to-back -back world champions and the entire League of Legends world were stunned. SKT were one game away from elimination. To their credit, SKT responded accordingly and adapted to the counter meta, winning games 4 and 5. but everyone knew that the game had changed. While Misfits didn't pull off the upset, they opened the door for a meta change that would affect the remainder of Worlds 2017, as well as shake the foundations of how teams at the highest level thought about the game. At the height of the Ardent Sensor meta, teams would force their compositions to fit the item. It was just that strong. But in Game 5 of the series between SKT and Misfits, no one built the item. At the highest level at the time, this was unprecedented. When it was win or go home, both teams bucked the established meta after seeing a viable counterplay that didn't exist. That is, until Misfits used it to nearly dethrone the most historically dominant team in the history of the game. At international events in the last few years, we haven't seen the Ardent Sensor meta, but what we have seen is the legacy of the 2017 Misfits and 2018's iteration of Cloud9 embodied in an aggressive style of play that flew in the face of the traditional Korean style of game. It's been championed and honed by teams like Europe's G2 and Invictus Gaming and Fun Plus Phoenix from China as the latter two rode that style to back-to-back -to -back world championships in 2018 and 2019. These teams made underdogs into champions and taught the world that if you can't beat them, you don't have to join them. Instead, you can blaze your own trail, rewrite the rulebook, and beat them over the head with it instead.